<coughs> All right, hey guys. Uh, civil rights lecture one. Uh, this is notes um, one through six, right? Which seems like a lot. All right, but we'll try to simplify it. Okay, so what I would say is I would definitely read through these a little bit before we talk about it just so you get an idea, okay? So we got to talk about rights. Uh, liberties versus rights. So your liberties are your basic freedoms, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and your rights kind of protect you against being treated poorly by the government, by individuals, all right? Um, and then generally like the First Amendment is where we see your civil liberties and your rights are the due process rights found in the Fifth Amendment, all right? And there's other places, but your rights protect you against discriminatory treatment or bad treatment by the government and your liberties are your freedoms, all right? Which we'll get into and we'll see as these come apart. Now, the Fifth Amendment protects your civil rights against the national government's actions, and your Fourteenth Amendment rights, uh, or Fourteenth Amendment protects you against uh, your civil rights from state government actions, which we're going to kind of break into. Now, again, you guys know what protects your natural rights, right? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, ideally legislation, you know, Supreme Court actions, state constitutions can protect your rights. Think of the founding of this country, that the states were definitely seen as the primary defender of your rights, as, you know, the government was much more decentralized at that moment, right? Okay. So, now here's something called the balancing test, right? Your rights are not absolute. You do not have the absolute right to do anything in speech or to practice any religion, right, etc. There's They balance freedom versus order, all right? So sometimes they're going to limit your natural rights. Um, but again, if they do limit your natural rights, your, natural, your, your civil rights or civil liberties, they're going to have to do it in a way that's fair, which we're going to break that down as we go through the unit, all right? So... Um, now, again, most people in the U.S., regardless of citizenship, get these rights, all right? Except, you know, voting, uh, serving on jury duties, that kind of thing, staying here forever, holding certain jobs. But most citizens, most people here have these rights. We'll give them to them, right? Now, we go back to the federalism, all right? This is a concept that's kind of difficult, but you can do it. All right, so... Originally, the Bill of Rights was designed to protect you from the national government. People felt that the states were close to the people and therefore they would protect your rights because they, could, they had a relationship that was close with the people and, and they could kick out the government that was, that was violating your natural rights if they were. Right? They're less likely at the state level than the federal level. But the federal government and the national government was so far away that they might actually violate your natural rights or they'd be more likely to. So that's what the Bill of Rights put into the Constitution by uh, the Anti-Federalists, that was part of the negotiation, right? Get that in there, all right? Now, a Supreme Court, court case said that. In 1833, Baron v. Baltimore, basically, you don't need to know the, the, the case itself, but the precedent set. 1833, it basically says, the Bill of Rights does not apply to the actions of the federal government. I'm sorry, the actions of state government. It protects you against the actions of the national government alone. Bear v. Baltimore. Your civil rights, civil liberties found in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, protects you from the national government. All right? And the state governments are not held accountable to the first ten amendments, which seems weird, right? But don't worry, we'll get there. Now, what happens, though, that's 1833. In 1925, we have a case called Getlow v. New York, which establishes a new precedent. And that precedent is, is that the Bill of Rights does, in fact, apply to the actions of state government. So states cannot also violate your natural rights or your natural liberties, your civil rights or civil liberties. So Baron v. Baltimore says the Bill of Rights protects you against the national government, not from the state governments. So you couldn't sue a state government saying they violated the First Amendment at that point in 1833. But in 1925, which is following the Civil War, which is following the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment has something in it called the Due Process Clause. The Fifth Amendment had something in it called the Due Process Clause. And what the Due Process Clause says is, in the Fifth Amendment, it says, the federal government will not deny you life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Baron v. Baltimore said, therefore, the Bill of Rights only applies to the national government. But in 1925... They use the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, which says no state shall deny any person life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So the 14th Amendment changes the game. They now say that the states are accountable to the Bill of Rights, just like the national government, because of the language in the 14th Amendment. All right? So, and that was a case called Gitlow v. New York, which establishes that new precedent. So you want to see Barron v. Baltimore and Gitlow v. New York in the same concept, all right? Now, 
The process of applying the Bill of Rights to the states is called incorporation. There are two views, total incorporation and selective incorporation. Basically, total incorporation does not exist. What that would have been is one court case would have said, all the Bill of Rights applies to all the states, done deal. They couldn't make it that easy, right? Because the states are fighting for their rights as well to control things. So, we go through a selective incorporation process, which means on a case-by-case -case basis, parts of the Bill of Rights were incorporated on a selective basis, incorporated to the states. So Gitlow v. New York incorporates freedom of speech to the states in its precedent. Then we get a whole bunch of other court cases that basically incorporate the Second Amendment, that incorporate the Third Amendment, incorporate the Fourth Amendment, and so on. Now, that's called selective incorporation, and the reason they do it is to mess with AP kids, right? No, the reason they do it is they do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Somebody says, this state has violated my right, it gets into the courts, and they say, yep, they sure did, and this applies to all states now. Religion, speech, press, right to assemble, and so on and so on. Eighth Amendment, yada, 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 okay? So, now, all these other ones have been applied. This is on page two. Now, um... All the Bill of Rights have been incorporated. Another synonym for incorporated is federalized. Another uh, synonym is nationalized. Federalized, nationalized, incorporated all mean the same thing, that parts of the Bill of Rights apply to the states. All right? Again, total incorporation didn't happen. Selective incorporation happened. So, now, everything's been incorporated except the second, the third, the seventh, and the tenth. And the grand jury requirement of the fifth. You don't need to memorize that, all right? Okay. Now remember that the Ninth Amendment says that no complete list of rights is possible. Therefore, the Ninth Amendment kind of says, just because we didn't list it doesn't mean we don't have it. And you know that that's the basis for privacy found in Griswold v. Connecticut. All right. Barron v. Baltimore, get low, incorporation, federalization, or nationalization all mean the same thing. They apply parts of the Bill of Rights to the states on a case-by-case basis. All right, there's a case that applies assembly. There's a case that applies the right to petition. There's a case that applies religion, search and seizure, etc., etc., etc. All right? Okay. Now, let's move on to speech. All right? Now, here's this speech. Thought versus action. Speech is somewhere in between, right? Generally, belief is always protected. Action is most restricted, but speech falls somewhere in between. Now, this is really what we're going to work on in class. All right? So, we have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the right to assemble and petition government. Okay? Okay. So, here's the thing. The Supreme Court has used some tests. When they, somebody says, this person, this state, this government has violated my free speech, the Supreme Court has a kind of guideline based on precedents in the past of how they will say, this speech was constitutional, you can't limit it, or this speech was unconstitutional, or you don't have the right to have this protected when they're applying the balancing test, right? Freedom versus order. One of them is the bad tendency doctrine. Now look at this. State legislatures and not the courts should generally determine speech, okay, which can be limited. But look at number two. This is the key to bad tendency doctrine. Speech can be limited if it might lead to harm or illegal action. So when they looked at a speech and they would say, a justice would say, okay, I'm following the bad tendency doctrine. And if that speech may lead to harm or it might lead to illegal action, therefore, it's not constitutional, it's dead. Or they say, no, nah, there's no potential for harm, no potential for illegal action, therefore, it's okay. All right? That's very easy to limit speech in that sense, right? Because you can make an argument that a lot of speech might lead to harm. All right? So, clear and present danger doctrine is another one. So, this is Schenck v. U.S. Schenck v. U.S. All right? Basically what this said, a guy was saying, don't take the draft for World War II. Now this is what they said. Speech can only be, in, uh, clear and present danger test. Speech can only be suppressed if there's an imminent threat to society. Meaning that speech will imminently, immediately lead to a threat of society. Then it can be limited. Now what that means is their example, and this is the one you always see on the test, is falsely saying fire in a crowded theater. That speech is leading to an imminent threat. People may trample each other, right? Okay, so that's much more uh, uh, um, harder to limit speech in that sense when you follow clear and present danger. Now there's another one that is not in the notes but I need to add for you guys, all right? And this is 
Brandenburg v. Ohio, right after clear and present danger, Brandenburg v. Ohio, it's the direct incitement test. And what the direct incitement test says is if the speech is inciting people to bad action, illegal action, like literally the speech makes people go do something illegal, something that will lead to harm, then it can be limited, which is again a very kind of makes it hard to limit speech, right? Okay. Now, we also have the preferred posi position doctrine, which this says is free speech is of the utmost importance and should therefore occupy, therefore occupy a preferred position above all others. Meaning, speech is so preferred, so important that we should never or we should rarely ever restrict it. So again, bad tendency, clear and present danger, direct incitement, preferred position. These are the tests that I'm going to actually have you use to look at some speech and say, this is okay, this is not okay. All right? And again, it depends upon the justice. It depends upon the time, right? The moment in history that this speech is happening. All right, now, non-protected speech. Libel and slander are written and spoken forms of defamation. Look up the word defamation. That is not allowed. Obscenity is not allowed. Fighting words are not allowed. And sedition is not allowed. All right? Now, the problem is, what is defamation? What is obscenity? What are fighting words and what is sedition, right? Fighting words, speech that leads to violence can be restricted. Obscenity. We're going to go back with press and define that in a second. All right? And you look up defamation, which is a written and spoken forms or libel and slander. All right? Now, sedition is essentially overthrowing the government. Now, in the past, sedition was you just simply ripped on the United States. That was sedition. They could throw you in jail. With the Smith Act, it kind of said you actually had to say let's overthrow the government. Now the kind of general definition of sedition is there's an actual imminent danger of overthrow and people actually urge to do something, right? Which means the speech is not just saying, ah, the United States, the government is terrible, yada, yada. It's literally like, hey, the United States government is horrible. We should overthrow it. I've got 100,000 buddies. I'm giving them rifles. Go get them. That's sedition now, all right? Okay. Now, look at protected speech. All right, they protect speech. One of the things that, um, if we look on page four, is we have a New York Times case, New York Times in 1971, all right? And that upheld that this idea of prior restraint. Like, generally, the government is reluctant to stop speech before it happens, all right? Because they want to protect speech. And so what the Pentagon Papers case, the New York Times uh, v. Sullivan in 1971 said is, you know, the Pentagon Papers were basically going to embarrass the national government, but it wasn't going to lead to um, national security, all right? Because quite often, government will claim national security to limit speech, all right? Vagueness. Laws from the state or national government can't be so vague that they'll limit any speech, right? Okay. Least drastic means test. Quite often what the court will say is, is there another way to handle this speech problem that you're dealing with if you're on the court without actually limiting speech? Can you move them to the other side of campus? Can you change the dates of the meetings? Something else besides limiting the actual speech. Now, again, political speech is important, especially in democracy. You've got to be able to speak your mind. We'll look at John Stuart Mill in class a little bit, all right? Now, symbolic speech, all right? Somewhere between speech and action. It's generally protected. So we have a court case, U.S. v. O'Brien. They were burning draft cards. No, I'm sorry. They were burning up. Uh, Burning draft cards is not protected because you're violating law, right? Okay. Um, Tinker v. Des Moines and Texas v. Johnson both said symbolic speech is protected. All right? Not say anything, but making a statement with a t-shirt, with a sign, with an action, something like that. All right. Now, if we look at the press. Now, here's the deal with the press. I think the framers were more concerned with press than speech because they were generally... Um, writing in pamphlets like the Federalist Papers, like John, you know, like Payne, right? Okay, now check this out. Balancing test applies. Freedom versus order, right? Press. It's just simply written speech, all right? So generally, here's the deal. Um, what we have is let's just look at defamation, let's look at obscenity, and let's look at student press, all right? And let's look at executive privilege, right? So executive privilege. U.S. v. Nixon basically said they have executive privilege unless they're committing a crime. So one of the things here is, is can a reporter write about things about the president and get them made public, right? Or, or can they not do it because of uh, national security? All right. Um, let's look at defamation, all right? Libel is written word, slander is a spoken word. It's not protected. Now look at this case. In defamation, New York Times v. Sullivan, 1968. 
64, 64. All right, sorry. Um, basically what that said is if you say something about a public figure, meaning a, a, an elected official, um, for them to prove defamation, they have to actually prove that there was malice, meaning somebody wrote about that person, they knew it was untrue, and they intended to harm their reputation, and they intended to harm them. But if it was true, it's not defamation. All right? Okay. And what New York Times v. Sullivan basically did is, before, government could limit the press, saying, ah, oh, that's defamation, it's not true. But what New York Times v. Sullivan 64 said is it allowed journalism the freedom to critique national government, which, again, that's democracy, right? Okay. Now, Obscenity is not protected, right? The old standard was it had to be without any redeeming value, right? What the hell does that mean? Obscenity is hard to define, and that's why we're always going to have cases about obscenity. We're always going to have cases about speech or the press. So look at this. Um, Miller v. California established a new uh, test for obscenity. Community standards must be violated. That allows for the South to be more conservative than the North and the West, etc., State obscenity laws must be violated. So they're allowing states to kind of define obscenity here, right? Federalism, right? And look at this last part, though. The material must lack serious literary, artistic, or political value, right? If it has none of those, then it can be deemed obscene. But if it has literary, artistic, political value, it can be not obscene and therefore allowed. And we're going to look and use obscenity, all right, for some lyrics in a song, all right, that we're going to look at in class today. Now, Hazelwood v. Colmeyer. High school newspapers are not a public forum and therefore can be restricted like other school activities. You have the freedom of the press, however, it's not the real press, all right? Okay. Um, now, again, you know, what about if, if we talk about press and speech, what about Twitter? What about YouTube? What about all that kind of stuff, right? Like, what if you say something about me, which I know you guys are always saying he's really nice? or I want to kill him, or he's a whatever, right? Like, can you do that? I mean, or the, can they limit that speech, right? Okay, because it's school-related, maybe, right? Okay, now, let's move over to assembly and petition, all right? The First Amendment has all this in it, speech, press, assembly. I mean, the First Amendment is chock full with your rights and liberties, I mean, all right? Now, freedom of petition, what the right to petition government for a redress of grievances. All that means is the right to go ask government for action for a problem. This justifies lobbying, right? Okay. Now, the other thing is the right to assemble. Now, check it out. Government can regulate the time, place, and the manner. So you can get permits. You know, you can't just go out and have, you know, a riot. You can't go out and have a march. You know, lots of times they can limit it. And again, this freedom versus order, right? Okay. Now, they can require police permits, etc. All right. Now, this is the Skokie case. All right. We're going to get into this right to assemble. We're going to look at it in class and apply this to it. You know, it's a group of neo-Nazis having a march in a town filled with uh, Holocaust survivors. Do they have the right to have that assembly? Right? Okay. So, I know that's a lot. I know it was definitely um, not the best, but I think that gives us a big overview, okay? So, try to do your best with this stuff, all right? And I'll see you in class.